for this chance to come together and to worship the Lord. If you stand, if you're here in person, if you're watching online, you can stand too. <laughs> Come to praise the name of the Lord our God. And praise His name forever. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior.
the storms may come and the winds may go, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word and will come to pass. Great is your Simplest, the easiest concepts, the ones that are easy to remember, are the hardest ones to live by. And just saying that over and over again, like, great is your faithfulness to me. Sometimes it's really easy for me to say, okay, I know that God is faithful, but sometimes it's hard for me to believe it. When I look at the struggles that I experience in my own life, and look at things not necessarily going the way that I thought they should. But just because things don't go the way we thought they should doesn't mean that God isn't faithful. 
So singing things over and over again, great is your faithfulness to me. Sometimes it's trying to, like a chisel, get through that hard rock of a head that I have and penetrate down into not just my head but my heart, remembering that God is faithful. So let's just sing that chorus one more time. Maybe you're not as thick-headed as me, and that's great. But I think we can all stand to remember the faithfulness of God. Let's sing that one more time. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are, your mercies are new every morning, that God, you are always there. And God, we need those reminders constantly. Uh, so God, thanks for your grace. Thanks for your patience with us. We pray that you would continue to be here among us as we worship you, as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. So Mr. Johnny was here last week and covered for me while we were out of town, and he started something new, and I realized that, um, you know, with COVID the way that it is, not everyone's comfortable coming to the front here. So we're still going to do a couple minutes focused on the kids, but if, if kids aren't comfortable coming up here, I think there's enough space that people, that they can be spread out. But um, So if you're less than you know, 12 years old, and you want to come over here, um, I've got a little message for you, but if you're not, you can stay in your seats, and that's fine, too, so... It's like, I don't want to go with that strange man. How are you guys doing? Good? Yeah? Who, how many of you have rules at your house? Yeah? No jumping on the bed. No you read my mind. I was going to ask you what some of those rules are. How about any other rules? No jumping on the bed. No screaming. No screaming. What else? No yelling. No yelling. Okay. How, how many of you like all the rules at your house? You jumped on the trampoline. That's awesome. Wow. What? You got a nap? Okay. So we don't always like rules, do we? But what? when your mom and dad tell you things like don't yell or don't jump on the bed, do you think that they're just trying to be mean and keep you from having fun? No. no. Why do you think they tell you things like that? So you don't hurt yourself. So do you think it's possible that rules and regulations might sometimes be put in our lives so that they can protect us? Yes. Yeah. None of you are driving yet, are you? No. No, I didn't think so. But I figured I'd just check just to make sure your parents are, you know, doing the right thing. But have you ever seen speed limit signs? Yes. You know what those signs mean? That tells you how fast. That's right. It tells you. Don't tell them what to do. You may go too fast. Right. That's good. Yeah. So sometimes 
rules and regulations. In fact, most times they're put there not to try to keep us from having fun, but in order to protect us, right? So today we're going to talk about something during the message about a rule that God gave us, and it wasn't for, uh, he didn't intend for it to be something that would keep us from having fun. He did it so actually for our benefit, okay? So you be listening to that, and, uh, and hopefully you guys will, will hear something that you'll remember, okay? How do you not love kids, man? I just you guys rock. You know, I'm a I'm a I'm I'm a rebel at heart, and you know I like to push the envelope. I'll usually find out, tell me what the rules are, and, and I'll see how far I can stretch them. Um, I'll go like right up to the edge of them and, and see that I don't break them, but. Um, but you know, if I can push them, or if if there's if something hasn't been said, I'll see if I can, you know, um, push it until t- somebody tells me, hey, you can't do that anymore. You know, you would think that that would mean that I was a fairly rebellious child, and I really wasn't. If my parents were around, you know, I would give you permission to ask them. Maybe it was because my older brother was the rebellious one and I watched what he did and so I did my best to avoid getting in trouble like he did. But I definitely saw certain rules that I looked at and I thought, well, why? Like, what's the purpose of that? And my mom always used to have a saying, um, you know, why is a crooked letter and you can't straighten it out? So every time I asked her, well, well, why? She said, well, why is a crooked letter and you can't straighten it out? Or um, better yet, my dad would say if I asked him why, well, because I said so or because I'm the father. And that never sat well with me because I always wanted to understand why. You see, sometimes I think in life we have prohibitions put on us and we don't fully understand the intention behind them. I mean, so cool that the kids, even at their age, are understanding that rules and regulations, they're not there um, to keep us from enjoying life or, or having fun, but they're there for our own protection and our own benefit. And I remember in my early 20s, I mean, maybe it's just guys in their early 20s, maybe it's everyone in their early 20s, but I thought that I was, you know, 10 feet tall and bulletproof and that outside uh, factors couldn't impact me at all. And so uh, I grew up in like southern New England and so uh, we would have winter weather often. And one night I was driving back from a friend's house. I was driving onto an entrance ramp to get onto the interstate and I uh, was probably driving a little bit faster than I should have driven because the conditions, it was icy and sleet and snow. And before I knew it, I had, com- I had started to spin and I did a hun- 360 degree spin completely on the entrance ramp and found myself, thankfully at least, pointing in this, the right direction. But I looked around, my heart was beating out of my chest and there was nobody else around, thankfully, And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I I can't believe I'm still here. And I quickly regained my senses, drove home. And from that point on, I think I realized that there's a purpose when they say drive as fast as conditions will allow. And from that point on, it really penetrated into my head to realize that sometimes rules and regulations are put there for our own benefit, to keep us out of harm's way. We consider the commandments and the instructions that God's given us. We need to look behind or beyond the the prohibitions that we see. You know, for me, that's what I look at. When someone says don't or no, you know, my first question is why? And I think we need to look beyond um, when someone says no and when God says no and ask why. Well, what's behind this? Is there a purpose? Is there an intention here? You know, the, re- the re- rebellious among us need to understand that God isn't trying to cramp our style. He's not 
trying to be some celestial killjoy that um, will keep us from having fun or enjoying ourselves. In fact, if we read the words that King David wrote in Psalm 37, 3 and 4, he said, Trust in the Lord with all and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, those don't sound like words of a, that are talking about a God who's trying to keep us from enjoying things and enjoying life. And God wants us to find delight, but he wants us to find it in the right place. It has to be in certain boundaries. And that's why he gave us instructions. They remind us, those instructions, that we're supposed to find rest and we're supposed to find solace and delight in him. In Exodus chapter 20, God gives his people the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. If you have a Bible, you can look there. If, if you have an app, you can do that as well. It'll be on the screen next to me, uh, reading in the New International Version. But Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, is the fourth commandment. It says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. It says in this passage that six days we should do work, but on the seventh day, God set it aside to be a Sabbath rest, a rest for the Lord. You know, uh, my family and I were away uh, last week, and we had the opportunity to go be with our family in Connecticut. And um, my wife's grandmother back in March turned 90. And after she had turned uh, 85, she decided that she wanted to get the family together every year and celebrate and we as a family said hey we want to be together because we want to celebrate this woman who has invested she had five children who were all married and those children had children and so uh, she had 12 grandchildren I think this was it, and then 25 great grandchildren um, so the family has just gotten bigger and bigger and she prays for each and every child and uh, child-in-law and grandchild and grandchild-in-law and great-grandchild by name every single day. And it makes sense that this woman who has invested so much would um, be someone that we can celebrate for an entire weekend. And we had so much fun. It was so joyous and delightful to, to spend time just thinking about all that she had done. We got to write songs um, and sing uh, songs about her as well. Um, and what a joy it was to take a weekend and to just reflect on her. Now, you th I think about what Carrie's grandmother has done, and in, in comparison to what God's done for us, it, it's it seems insignificant. It's significant, but compared to what God did, it, it's small. And so if we can set aside an entire weekend to celebrate somebody, then can we not also consider a day set aside for the one who created us, the one who saves us, the one who's given us everything that we have? Do we think that way when it comes to God? Do we say, hey, considering all that God's done for us, considering all that he is, are, are we willing to, to set aside a day and say, God, we want to reflect on who you are, on what you've done for us. You see, the Sabbath was created for God, that we might worship him. God didn't need a rest but um, in the way that we think about rest. But 
He wanted this to be in our cycle, our rhythm of life, so that we would reflect and remember Him. You know, that's really what worship is. It's giving worth to something or someone. And so if we are, say that we're worshiping God, we're showing His worth. And by taking an entire day and setting it aside, saying, God, this is for you. Finding and celebrating Sabbath rest, it presses the pause button in our lives to stop, to thank God for what he's done and what he's given to us. And so, but Sabbath rest is not only for God. It's for others as well. And if we look over in Exodus chapter 23, there's more instructions that God gives his people it says in Exodus 23, starting in verse 10, For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused, and the poor among your people may get food from it. The wild animals may eat what's left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, so the slave born in your household the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. So Sabbath is for God, but it's also for others. And we read not only in Exodus 20 when God gave the instruction to, to carve out a day, but also here that our sons, our daughters, those people who work for us, even our animals and our beasts of burden, that we all need rest. You know, if we own our own business or operate our own business, if we have people who work for us, it's probably not good if we say, hey, I need a rest, I need a Sabbath, but you keep working. Uh, we need to make sure that if we're um, going to embrace what God said to us, that we also pass that on to others as well. Now, I've been astounded as I've looked at companies who have instilled this value into the ethos of their, their corporation. You know, the first company that comes to mind when I think about this is Chick-fil-A. And, and I think there's something uh, in Chick-fil-A that I, the, the day that I crave it the most is the day that it's not open and available to me. Like on Sundays, I always find myself being like, Oh, man, I can really go for a Chick-fil-A sandwich, some waffle fries, and some sweet tea. And then I'm like, it's Sunday. Like, that's the worst. Or if you're traveling through, like, the Atlanta airport, and you go to the, the, uh, the food court, and you realize that uh, Chick-fil-A is closed because it's Sunday. But yet, you would think that a company that says, hey, we want to embrace the idea of Sabbath, that, that it would... It would impact their sales. It would impact them. But if you go by any Chick-fil-A any day of the week, at least the ones around here, they're always booming all the time. And even through COVID, I feel like they should probably be running the government because they do things so much better. And they have such an incredible way of just keeping things flowing. And they've embraced this value to say, hey, not only us, but the people who work for us. We want to set aside a day and say, hey, God told us that we need to have Sabbath rest. And so we're going to set aside a day for ourselves and those who work for us. And they don't need to stay open because God's providing for them in the other day, days of the week. And we see that here in Exodus 23 that God was saying to his people that, hey, all these other years continue to, to work, continue to labor, but trust that I'll provide for you. We saw that weeks ago when we looked at God providing manna for his people, that he said, hey, collect enough the day before so that you won't have to do any work on Sabbath. And God made sure that they had everything that they needed. I think it's proof that God will bless us when we abide by his instructions and his commands. He'll give us what we need so we don't have to worry about the work that we're missing. You know, it seems like the number seven, if we read through all of the Bible, it's a significant number. And here we see that, 
that they're saying the seventh day they rested and on the seventh year that people rested as well. It became a Sabbath year and allowed for, for poor, those who didn't have much to eat, for even the wild animals to eat. And despite our individualistic and self-centered culture, the rest of others should be important to us as well. So how are we encouraging and imploring others to find Sabbath rest and to make it a priority in the rhythm of their lives? Sabbath rest is, is for God. Sabbath rest is for others. And then Sabbath rest is for us as well. A, a Jewish commentator Abraham Joshua Heschel, he wrote, six days a week we seek to dominate the world. On the seventh day, we try to dominate the self. <laughs> and I think to myself, yeah, we probably need more than just one day out of the week to try to dominate ourselves. And one of the greatest battles that we probably face on a day-to-day -day basis is the battle with ourselves. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about this when he wrote to the early churches, he spoke of the struggle in his letters, of struggling with his flesh, struggling with the sin that entangles us, the sin nature into which we're born. But Sabbath gives us an opportunity be, to begin to dominate ourselves, to get the upper hand by resting, by finding solace, by delighting ourselves in God. In fact, many Jewish commentators, they believe that the seventh day God created rest, but not in the way that we know rest. Um, I appreciate how Dan Allender, an author and speaker, says it. He says, rest in this regard is a joyous repose, tranquility, or delight. And I think back to what David wrote in Psalm 37, delighting ourselves in the Lord, finding a joyous repose and tranquility. Think about the things in your life that delight you, the things that bring you joy and tranquility. What are the things that create those in your life? Dan Allender also wrote this. He said, there's so much uncertainty and loss in our lives, from the death of a parent to the rising cost of gasoline. To consider what delights us is to stand accused by the countless moments of onerous obligation and unfulfilled dreams. Instead, we'd rather settle for distraction than open our hearts to what seems beyond our wildest dreams. We've learned to manage our disappointment with God, and we don't want our desire for delight to seduce us again. You think about what it means to actually allow ourselves to be delighted in something and to find that delight in God and God alone. I think we're really good, and I speak for myself in this too, that I'm really good at distracting myself. It's really easy for me to sit down and binge watch things. It's really easy for me to get my head into something that's probably not that significant. And God's not saying, hey, those things are bad, but he's saying, where are you finding your delight? Where am I finding my delight and my joyous repose? You know, I think about my own family and the idea of rest. There are some among my family members that if, if they don't get their proper night's rest, then the whole world will pay for at least 24 hours afterwards, if not 48 hours that they need, we need to all make sure that they're getting the rest that they need. Otherwise, none of us will be happy. You think about the fact that that's a physical rest. But do we think of rest beyond just the physical, beyond just sleep and relaxing? Do we think about emotional rest? Do we think about spiritual rest? Do we think about mental rest as well? At the end of this passage in Exodus chapter 23, God's instructions to his people are, be careful to do everything I've said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. This instruction that God tells his people to avoid the names of other gods on their lips. You see, I think we're short-term memory people, but by being Sabbath people, we become people of remembrance. 
We remember what God has done. I think we need that every seventh day to come back around because on those other six days, we begin to get the names of, of the other gods in our life on our lips. Whether it's work, whether it's uh, recreational things, whether it's school, whatever it might be, these other things creep up and they demand our allegiance. And they say, I'm enough for you. I'm significant for you. I'll give you what you need. And we need that seventh day to remind us, to bring us back to reality because we're short-term memory people that need that reminder. So by instilling the value of Sabbath into the rhythms of our week, we constantly keep God before us. We constantly keep his name on our lips rather than letting him be crowded out by the other gods that are vying for our allegiance, for our attention, for our affection, and that promise us delight that never ever satisfies us. When we put those other things in the position of God, we will always find that they can never satisfy us, that we can never truly find delight in them the way that we find delight in God. That's what Sabbath does to us. That's why, that's why God gave it to us, to remind us that our delight needs to be found in Him and Him alone. And so what do we do with all this? The first question we ask, what are you doing to regularly thank God for who he is and what he's done? You know, I don't think God created the Sabbath so that we can just sit there like in a prayer room all day and pray and read our Bibles. That, that may be part of it. But delighting in God is also delighting in his creation, whether that's our family and our children, whether that's actual creation and hiking or biking or doing other things. I think God, each of us finds uh, that thing in which we delight that reminds us who God is and what he's done in different ways. And so how are we doing that? And what are we doing to regularly find that space and find those places in which we delight in who God is? And then second, how are we encouraging others to practice Sabbath rest? Is it something that we say, hey, I need this, but it's not important to you? Are we modeling it well for other people? Are we saying, hey, this is important for me, and I think it should be important for you as well? And then how are you practicing Sabbath rest and finding delight for your soul? You know, maybe this week you can take time to just... Think about the things in which you delight, the things that remind you over and over again of who God is and what he's done and say, God, help me to focus on these things. Help me to carve out time in my life, to find a rhythm in my life so that I can at least focus on this for part of it and be reminded of who you are and what you've done for us. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your rules and instructions that are not always easy, yet God are so important for us. So remind us every day of why they're there. Remind us of what you've done for us and remind us to carve out that space, that time that we might delight ourselves in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are, are people of remembrance, people who need that, those reminders of, of who God is and what he's done. You know, there's something about slowing down every seven days for a Sabbath. But there's also something to be said about coming to a table and slowing down. And those of us who in our own families have seen the importance and the value of sitting around a table, of, of having a meal together, of putting devices away and just saying, hey, like, let's come together as a family. We slow down when we come to a table. The other thing that the table does for us is that it's, it's kind of an even, evening um, place where it doesn't matter 
who we are or what we've done, when we come to the table, we are all equal. And when we think about the table of Jesus Christ, that's an important reminder as well. That it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've come from, what's happened in our lives. Because when we come to the table of Jesus Christ, he extends to us his grace. He extends to us his forgiveness. He says, you are my child. You know, the only thing that we have in Scripture as far as what would prevent us from coming to this table is if we don't know who Jesus is. And so if you're here today and you don't know who he is or you're wondering who he is, then, you know, maybe this table isn't for you right now at this moment. But for this is a table for those who say, hey, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And I want to take part in this meal. This is a meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. Something that we talked about even in past weeks about the Passover. Where they were reminded of God protecting them and saving them. By putting the blood on their doorposts, the angel of death passed over them. And protected and saved them. But then... Jesus came and told them that instead of having to sacrifice other animals, I'm going to be a sacrifice, not that you're going to have to do regularly, but will be your once and for all, forever sacrifice that will last into eternity because of who I am and what I've done for you. And at this table, we remember that. Jesus, with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which was broken for you. They ate their meal and, and afterwards they, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is a cup, the cup of the new covenant the cup of forgiveness, my blood poured out for many. And Jesus put new meaning into these things that the disciples had grown up with, telling them that this bread represented his body, that this cup represented his blood. And the apostle Paul, in giving instructions to the early church, he said, When we come to the table, when we celebrate this meal together, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we'll continue to do this. And one day, before the throne of God, there will be a feast celebrating what God has done. And in the meantime, this is what we would call a foretaste. It's an appetizer for what we will experience one day together. And we come to this table, all who are broken, all who are heavy laden, all whose burdens have weighed them down. We come to the one who can carry it all, who forgives when we repent. And so let's take a minute and pray just before we come to the table. God, thank you. Thank you for what this table means for us. Thank you for what you have done through this table. God, as we take part in these elements, we pray that you would remind us of your body broken for us, of your blood shed for us, of the forgiveness that we receive, not because we're worthy, not because we've done something, but because you've seen fit to extend your grace to us. And so, Father, may we live lives of gratitude because of that grace showered down upon us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Try to make this as, as um, friendly, COVID-friendly as possible. Um, cups are um, spread out on the table. Um, if you need gluten-free, these are gluten-free crackers as well. But um, I'm just going to play a little bit softly. Um, Feel free to come uh, whenever you feel ready. Take the cup, um, take a cracker from which, whichever one uh, suits you, um, and be reminded 
that God said, this is, Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Eat you all and remember and reflect on what I've done for you. Oh, love of God, how rich it is. 
centuries before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah spoke the words of the Lord and spoke of the suffering servant who would come. He said, surely you took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the table that God has given to us through Jesus Christ, and we are grateful for it. Let me pray for us again. God, thank you for this gift. Thank you for, thank you, Jesus, for your body, your blood, broken, shed for us. And thank you for what we receive through that. God, may, we know we will never be worthy of that, but that's your grace. And so, Father, may we not try to be worthy, but may we always be reminded and mindful of what you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, a few things um, just as we uh, continue, as we go out from this place today. Um, first of all, uh, the branch started out of another church um, that's in Mechanicsville, uh, a few years ago. And uh, that church has finally found um, a, a more permanent home. And so next week they're having a homecoming, a celebration uh, to celebrate them being in this new building and space. And so uh, we aren't going to meet in person here uh, at the branch next week. We'll be back again the following week. Um, there'll be some people who are going to go uh, to that celebration service. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, and that's fine as well. Uh, we will also have a virtual option next week um, we'll, where there will be a message uh, not only on YouTube um, and shared on Facebook, but also on our podcast. Um, speaking about YouTube and a podcast as well, knowing that we all live busy lives, knowing that um, some of us are traveling, especially during the summer months. Just know that those things are there and available for you. If you want to subscribe to our YouTube page, they'll send reminders every time there's a new video there. You can catch the whole service there. If you're a podcast kind of person, uh, you can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, Spotify, other places as well. Um, if you want to listen to me at 1.5 speed or more, that's fine too. It might sound like a chipmunk. I get it. Um, so uh, just know that those are there. We would love for you to, um, to check those out, especially if you're not here. And if you feel like sharing them, we would be so grateful for that as well. Um, so just again, a reminder that we won't be here in person next week. And one of the things that we say here at the branch all the time is that partnership is key. And we know that the only way that we can do anything is if we remain in, in Jesus. That's where we get our name from. The branch it comes from John 15, 5, where Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. And so our first and foremost priority and partnership is partnering with God, that he would give us what we need in order to accomplish his will. But then there are other ways that we partner. We partner together with one another. We partner in the community to find others because in God's word in Jeremiah, it says to seek the peace and prosperity of the place where I have planted you. And so we're always trying to find ways that we can partner to say, hey, how are we seeking the peace and prosperity of Ashland in the schools, in different organizations? And we're sharing that out on our Facebook page, on our Now Serving page as well. We would love for you to join with us in serving, in partnering together in service. And those opportunities are available and are put out there. There are a couple of things that are coming up at, uh, at the end of the summer. There's a Bright Beginnings program that the YMCA does uh, that we have information on. You can sign up to help with that. We're, the uh, Community Services Board is continuing to use our space on Monday and Tuesday mornings and then Wednesday evenings, and uh, they could use volunteers for that. There's a Sign Up Genius online, and you can sign up for that. So we appreciate partners in service as well. And then we also appreciate partners in prayer. There are so many things to be constantly praying for and saying, God, we want to keep before you. 
We want to keep in step with you. And so if you want to find out the different things that the branch is praying for throughout the week, you can actually check out the calendar on our, on our uh, website and find out about that. And then uh, we are always seeking partners financially. And there are different ways that you can give. If God's led you to that point where you say, hey, I want to make the branch, um, I want to partner with them beyond uh, just coming, even beyond serving, um, but also in giving. You can give financially, but also giving of your time, giving of your efforts as well. And like I said, we'll do our best to make sure that we're letting you know of those opportunities. For all, whichever way that you've chosen to partner with us, we're grateful for that and grateful for um, what that means. You know, in the upcoming uh, weeks and months too, we'll probably talk more about partnership and what that looks like, even to say, hey, I wanna be a ministry partner and make a bigger commitment to the branch. What does that look like? What are the things that uh, that looks like to me and what am I committing to if I say, hey, I wanna be a ministry partner of the branch? This fall, we'll also be kicking off uh, children and youth Programs. I know some of you, your kids have done an incredible job. Um, I know that every parent feels like their kid's the loudest one in the midst of a service, but trust me, like it's awesome to hear that. And I think there's something that happens when we come together as families, even hearing those little voices. So thank you for continuing to persist. Um, what we're going to do in the fall is we're going to have an opportunity for uh, ages zero through um, fifth grade, um, and we'll start. We'll all start out here, and then at some point, right before the message, um, kids will be released to go uh, into our children's area as well. So we're going to need partners in that. Um, people who can volunteer their time. If there's enough of us, it'll only be like a monthly commitment um, to that. So you don't have to have kids to be part of that. Um, uh, we're going to do. Uh, what we need to do as far as being safe and secure, doing background checks on our children and youth volunteers as well. Um, but uh, we would love for you to partner with us in that as well. Uh, after I pray and send this out, um, we also need to get this room back to what it needs to be for uh, the community service board programs throughout the week, putting some tables in and, and taking some chairs out. So thanks again for joining us, whether you're here in person, whether you're watching online. I'm grateful for, the, for you, grateful for you being here, and hope that God will continue to use you and bless you. Let's stand as we uh, are, are um, dismissed, knowing that God calls us to a time of rest, and so may we find rest in God, may we find delight in God, and know that as we go off into this world, that we go with the authority of God the Father, we go with the power of God the Holy Spirit, and we go in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us.